which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 35, and some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And some one ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And what the Lord is showing me on this one, when it talks about the sour wine and what he's talking about, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's taking me to the book of Ruth. And what the Lord wants to say is in this season, in this dire season, when things feel dark, when the lights literally go out, I'm your kinsman redeemer. Praise God. I think, I, I really feel like this is a word for y'all today that, and it's, it's really been speaking to me this week, when the lights go out, I'm your kinsman redeemer. And what's the, the significance about him making, taking on sour wine? His first miracle was turning the water into wine, which wine means anointing. It means a refreshing. It means that you kind of, like we talk about getting drunk in the spirit. It talks about this, this anointing. That, and Jesus talks about in Mark 2 uh, that you can't put old or new wine into old wineskin. And what a sour wine represents. Sour wine represents the counterfeit wine that the enemy twists. It's the bitter wine. Why, does, why do bad things happen to good people? Because we live in a fallen world. The fallen world produces a sour wine. Are you following? Yeah. Heaven produces a fresh wine. Fallen world produces a sour wine. Did you know in winemaking, out of the 20,000 species of wine, there's one grape that they all derive from. So with every move of God that has ever happened, there's one grape, there's one source, there's one person who was pressed to be poured out for us. So we get all kind of sideways with, well, in this revival, it happened this way, and this happened this way, and this happened this way, and this happened this way. It's all one grape. It's all one wine. It's all one fire. And it's best that we figure out the themes of heaven rather than the outcome of behaviors. Are you hearing? Oh, man. So what the Lord told me is he said, when I, when I took the sour wine on the cross, what I was doing is I was acting as your kinsman redeemer. Because in Ruth, the book of Ruth, verse 20, chapter 1, Naomi says, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And some of us, we feel that. We take that on. The Lord is dealt very bitterly. The earth has been hard on me. My marriage has been hard on me. My, my finances have been hard on me. My body has been hard on me. And what the Lord says is you have the option today to either drink the sour wine or his wine. And you know why you have that option? Because he took the last drink of sour wine ever to be served on the cross. That's what that represents. Why, know, why do you have suffering now? Why do you have hard times now? Why do you have disease now? Why do you have decay now? Because the, the, fi the finale of that word, of that prophetic act on the cross, hasn't finished until he comes back again. But what it did is it really broke the curtain to say, hey, child, you don't have to drink the sour wine anymore. I have a fresh wine for you. I have a fresh anointing for you. And when he's hanging on the cross, he's thinking about the bitter things in your life that are causing you to lose sleep. It's not that just like he took the cross with you in mind. He took the cross with you in mind and what's causing you to lose sleep on a Tuesday is on his mind. Whoa! That should blow you away. He took this sour wine. Because the Lord hasn't dealt bitterly with us. He's dealing sweetly with us. Put on the reed and gave it to him to drink. Wait, let us see either whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered in a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. God broke out of his box. And he's willing to, and he intends to break yours. Let's go over to Matthew 27. Because Matthew 27, 51 gives us more detail of what it looks like for the curtain to be broken or torn in two. And the significance about the curtain being torn in two is God was saying, I'm no longer just found in the Holy of Holies, but I'm found in spirit and truth everywhere. 
I'm found where I, the hungry are. I'm found where the, hum, the humil, where the humble are. I'm found where the meek are. I'm found with the servants are. I'm found in my people who are longing after me, who want to drink the fresh wine and not indulge in a bitter wine. Some of us are addicted to that worm theology. I'm a worm, I'm no good, I'm terrible. We're addicted to that worm theology. With our writers group, I took Psalm 22 and I took out all the good pieces of Psalm 22 and just did all the miserable things. And we read it and I think Corey or Rob was like, I feel sick after hearing that. But we do have this worm theology where we feel like we have to just beat ourselves and we have to have this pain and this suffering. And I can tell you friends, he already took that. He already, he already took that. He already drank. He finished it with the sour wine. So we could, he could give us new life. Some of you are still not processing exactly what I'm saying. He took the beating for you. But let me just, let me say it this way. Fasting is not for you to feel miserable. It's not. Fasting is not for you to suffer. He, like, we talk to someone and they're like, well, maybe the Lord won't heal me because he wants me to suffer. I mean, some of you in this room have said that. I just don't see that in scripture. Maybe in his divine reasoning, he hasn't done it yet. Maybe it hasn't been released yet, but he still is Jehovah Rapha, is he not? Is God the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? Okay, we can't redefine what his wine tastes like just because our experience, we've been, we spent so much time with the sour wine, we're calling his wine sour. He doesn't serve a sour wine. It's not sour, so then it'll eventually turn sweet. He, turn, he, he serves a good wine. What do they say at the feast? Did you, you save the best for last? We're all plastered. We don't even, we can't even taste how good this is. That's what they were saying. That's what it says, okay? I'm not <laughs> condoning anything. So when the curtain tears, because the curtain was the thing that divided the priest or God's presence where it chose to dwell from the people. Like priests would walk in there with bells around their ankles because if there was anything unholy in them, they would drop dead. That's the seriousness of God's presence. So when we say pre God's presence over our preference, know that we're going after a very serious thing. Because God's not, not uh, to be handled lightly. Oh man, I had some announcements to tell you, but I forgot them. <laughs> Verse 51 in Matthew 27. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Not a feat that anyone could do. And that's why, that's why it was so specific that it was top to bottom. It was trying to say only God could have done that. How many of you without machinery could go reach up there and tear this curtain? Maybe Dale. Maybe Dale and Rob, but that's it. Mike would be in there too. That's it. Oh, three, three guys. But they're even as tall as they are, there's no way that they could rip it top to bottom. Only God could rip it top to bottom. And that's how the blessing flows. It flows from top to bottom. Where there's unity, the Lord commands a blessing. What happens? That the oil goes on Aaron's head and it flows down to his beard. It blesses the people. God's blessing always fall, fall, flows from top to bottom. That's why I don't like multi-level marketing. Because the blessing always falls, flows up. You want blessing to flow down. You want to be blessed in your business? If you're the boss, let, let your blessing flow down. Take your profit shares last. I know that's, that's a hard thing to say, but if you want to be blessed in your business, is your blessing flowing down or is it flowing up? If you want to be blessed in your home, dad, leader of the house, is blessing flowing up to you or down to your kids? A wise man leaves inheritance to his children's children. Your children aren't there just to serve you, to sit in your recliners, to space out. Is the blessing flowing down? Wives, is the blessing flowing down? Managers, is the blessing flowing down? The blessing flows from top to bottom. Are you here? Are you? Oh man, I hope you're. 
Okay, it gets even crazier. The earth shook. There was an earthquake. Lights go out. He drinks a sour wine. They're like, man, what was in that sour wine? It really is stirring some stuff up. It's probably tart ger- cherry juice. It's disgusting. So he drinks this wine. Lights go out. Curtain tears top to bottom. There's an earthquake. It shakes. Rocks split in two. Some things are happening, wouldn't you say? So we, again, because he died, we get what we get. Things broke off when he died. Freedom broke loose when we died. Healing came out when he died. You have to, we have to hear that. We have to see that. Rocks were split, this verse 52. The tombs were also open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. What? That's, this is nuts. He's on the cross, naked, beaten, just said his fifth thing. He's about to die, right? Lights go out. The curtain tears in two from top to bottom. There's an earthquake. Rocks are splitting in two. The dead are rising. He hasn't even, he hasn't risen from the dead. Easter hasn't happened yet. This is all Good Friday. There's been no egg hunts. There's been some Palm Sunday and some Passover. But we're not even at Easter yet. And here we are. And the dead are rising and rocks are splitting and the, the earth is quaking. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I mean, how long were the dead? They, they rised and then after his resurrection, they went forward. Okay, imagine that. They said over like 500 witnesses of the dead rose up. So they rose up. What were they doing? Like consulting about heaven? Like, oh, I just saw you in the throne room. <laughs> like, what were they doing? What were they doing waiting for Jesus to rise? Even the dead who are risen, wait for him to tell the world. That, that should blow your mind. Verse 54, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. When they saw the things, when they saw how heaven moved earth, They responded to heaven. Truly, this is the Son of God. Truly, this, why did it take an earthquake? The dude walked on water, fed fed many multiple times, like delivered the demoniac man. Like that's all it would take for me. Like a guy naked, yelling, cutting himself and can break chains. He's all calm and like conducting business at the gate all of a sudden. I'm going to follow the guy who can do that. Like that's pretty good. But then he dies, he calls a shot, dies, and then raises from the dead. That's even better. But it takes an earthquake. Why is that important? Why why is the earthquake important? Why is the rock splitting so significant? Could anyone... Because when the water, when the rock splits, water comes out. What happened when his side was pierced? Water came out. What does he say? I'm the living water. If you drink of me, you'll never thirst. Do you, do you see what, what that means? Do you, do you understand that the ramifications of God putting Adam into a slumber through his power and then conducting a rib removal is a birthing of a woman. It's a birthing of a co-heir. It's a birthing of a helpmate. Do you hear that? So when Jesus was pierced in his side, it's a birthing of the church. It's a birthing of a helpmate. It's a birthing of a co-heir. So his co-heir that came out of his side can't have a worm theology. Oh man, I hope you could hear it. So all of a sudden the centurion comes to this, this realization Truly, this man was the son of God. See, what we don't, and really what got him, it was, it was the earthquake. That was pretty, that was significant. It was the rock breaking. That was significant. The centurion wouldn't care about the temple. He, he, would, he would give two flips about it. He just, it wouldn't even matter to him. But what really would matter to him is his expertise in crucifixion. Yeah. 
What really would matter to him is that he saw multiple people die over and over and over again by the same, uh, the same act of crucifixion. And what really, really got him is he saw Jesus take his last breath on his own. I want you to think about that. What really got the centurion to believe that he was the son of God is he called a shot. Why? Because when he talked to Pilate, he said, no one takes my life, but I give it freely. And this centurion who had a front row seat to murder after murder after murder after murder saw this man give up his spirit and breathe his last on his own. Why? Why did God do that? Why did Jesus do that? Because it needed to be done. You can say love, John, you can quote John 3.16, and you'd be so right. But the truth is, it needed to be done. The earth didn't need to shake, the rocks didn't need to split, but he needed to die. Because he decided to pay my debt of sin and your debt of sin. That's why he died. There had to be bloodshed. He was a perfect, spotless lamb. And he laid down his life for us freely. God didn't force him to do this. In fact, Jesus pleaded with him in the garden. If this could pass from me, if your cup, if your cup of wrath could pass from me, if your cup of wrath, that's what that means. That cup, it means all of God's wrath. And we think of like a little, I don't know, like a little chalice or something. Like, oh, it's a little eight ounce cup of wrath. You know, if you, if you read Revelation 13, there's an angel that had to be created to carry the bowl of wrath that is God that he's going to pour out. Think of, think of that. Like, think of the ability of an angel. Like, how big is this angel? Like, if you try to calculate the amount of bloodshed that's going to happen when God pours out his wrath in Revelation 13, the river is, at, is miles long. The human body can carry about five liters of blood. And it talks about the length and the depth of this river that's going to happen. Woo, that's a big bowl. So he wasn't like pleading for God to like, oh, this nice, sweet eight ounce cup of wrath with your chamomile tea normally that you put in there and a dash of honey. No, this is huge. This is massive. Massive amounts of God's wrath all poured out on his son because his son lived a perfect life and we couldn't. Jesus paid the price. And when he paid that price, he broke out of his box and said, I'm ready to be with you in spirit and in truth. And he wants, he wants to be in relationship with you and he wants to be in relationship with me. For what reason? I haven't figured it out yet. I still don't even know why Amanda married me. I just, <laughs> lucky, better lucky than good, I guess. But why the creator of the world would pour out all of his adorning love on me and you through his son. The death of Jesus is really when he broke out of his box. Some of it we liked, I mean, man, I love the ministry of Jesus. I love healings and deliverance and signs and wonders. I love all, all that stuff's amazing. That's why he said, I've been anointed for this is the year of the favor of the Lord, that blind eyes will open, that the captive will be set free, that I will cleanse the love. He said that, he, he announced that that was the whole reason why he was on the scene in the first place. But we're thinking about like the temporal and he's talking about the eternal. Like if I don't die today, then you'll die for eternity. And he exchanged one day of death and pain, or not three days of death and pain for your eternal life. That is a great exchange that takes place. And what, what is your entry point to receive the benefit of his death? You've lied. You've cheated. You've coveted. You've wanted something that wasn't yours. You stole. You've murdered. You've committed adultery. You've broken his law. And that requires you to receive his free gift. 
And Paul says, okay, that doesn't mean you keep on sinning. It means you accept repentance is to say, yes, I'm broken. I've sinned. I've broken his law. I don't want to anymore. I want to walk in this freedom. I want to walk in relationship with Jesus. Because he died, he broke out of his box. And he intends to break yours. No more can we preach sermons that are humanistic in nature. This is not a self-help club. This isn't a book just to make you feel better. Nor is it a book to make you feel worse. It's, it's a book to show you how you decrease and he increases. That's it. That's it. I'm crucified with Christ. What does that mean? That means every day I'm flipping through the pages. How can I put myself on the cross this morning? What in me needs to die this morning? What in me needs to go away this morning? What in me needs to, uh, to dissolve this morning? And what if Jesus needs to come out? What if Jesus needs to come out? See, what I mean by God intends to break your boxes, it's not just that he's going to break any thought, theology boxes or any dogma boxes or any like practicality of like how church is done because church is done on a wide, wide spectrum. Do you guys know that? I don't know if you knew that. 72 churches in Kootenai County and none of us are the same. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. I never would have thought. So the diversity that we have within the kingdom of God is really speaks to a tapestry like Joseph's coat of many colors. And God's favor, God is favored when his church adorns many colors and rejoices with him and with each other. So what's the point of breaking these boxes? The point of breaking these boxes is one, the box would represent your coffin. God wants to break the box of death off you. Because he came to give life and life abundantly. Life and life abundantly, like a lot of life. More than you can think or imagine, pressed down, shaded together, flowing over. These aren't just offering services. These aren't just offering uh, uh, verses, but these are, this is a part of his kingdom. This is the economics of his kingdom. I hope some of you can get excited about that. He wants to break the box of what, how you see yourself. Some of you, we're like singing this song, like, like he's worthy, he's worthy. And we're so focused on ourselves. All you're saying is I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy. And it's a time designated for his praise. And all we can think about is our unworthiness. Like that makes zero sense. It's like jumping into the lion's den and be like, I think I got this. Have you seen like the, have you seen bears wrestling each other? Like on a video? And I saw, I saw this video online this week and there's like two uh, grizzly bears wrestling each other. I'm like, dang, that dude just slapped that dude across the face. And then in the caption said, there's people on this earth that believe they could win this fight. That's, that's what it's like when we get in his presence, when we get in his glory, when we're overcome by his power and all we can do is think of ourselves. It should be overshadowing. It should be eclipsing. I say all these things that God wants to break through your boxes because I can tell you, friends, that things are going to get harder. Things are they're going to get harder. They're going to get harder. And all we can do is have get harder in our grit. Get harder in our resolve. Press in closer to the Father. Because we're not promised tomorrow. I feel like there's such an urgency for us to break through our, our own perspectives, our own boxes that we put God in. Well, God can move this way and God can move that way and God can be this way and God can do this. And then I'm in this box and I can never preach or I can never share the gospel. I could never, we would do all these absolute language that we throw out. We put, we cage ourselves in. 
There's absolute truth. I believe in absolute truth. I've experienced gravity. <laughs> but there's boxes that we put ourselves in and we put God in and they can never connect. And God, I don't know if you know this, God's not too fond about being in a box. In fact, those who, the, the Philistines try to steal the box that God was in at the time and their gods died. So when you try to contain what God is doing or snuff out what God is doing, he has a tendency to break out. I was sitting in prayer and we're going to kind of transitioning into ministry time now because I've got some words I'd like to share. Because I've, when I was in my prayer time this morning for 21 days of prayer and fasting, I want to encourage all of you to get, get a prayer time to show up to. God told me in the first day that um, he'll match your willingness with his willingness. Everyone say amen. That's a good word. Okay, now here comes the second part. He will match your unwillingness with unwillingness. God is anning up. He's anning up. And so it's not necessarily, it's not about having this designated place. You have to come spend time at the designated place. And we're not counting our cookies to say, well, look how many volunteers we had come to the church. Pat our back. It, this is just designated for a time corporately. If you need to do it at home, do it at home, but seek the Lord. What the, the whole point of 21 days of prayer and fasting is to increase your hunger for him. That's it. It's not about coming to the church. It's not about spending time in a prayer room. It's not about, it's not about any of that. It's about spending time with him. I'd rather you spend more time with him than more time here. I'm going to say that again because some of you don't believe me. I'd rather you spend more time with him than more time here. Because what do we say? At New Life, we care more about you than what you can do for us. Like, we want you here. We want to be in relationship with you. We believe that relationship is the best place for you to grow. You can grow alone, but you can grow weird. That's proven in Scripture. Have you read John the Baptist? <laughs> Brother, it was weird. <laughs> I grew alone. Yeah, but you eat bugs and honey and wear a camel belt. It's strange, man. Strange. You smell weird. No one wants to be around you. That was a joke, but you live and learn, live and learn. It's about being in community with one another. Church isn't about our count. It's not about our resume. It's not about how impressive we are, but it's about being in relationship with one another. Because I have something that Tom needs and Tom has something that Angie needs and Angie has something that Rebecca needs and it's all cyclical. It's all wheels within a wheel. We all talk about, well, church is not the building. Oh, I know. Talk to my three-year-old. You know what the church is to my three-year-old? This building. You know what the church is to my three-year-old? Candy that it gets from his teacher because he knows that there's sweet things that come from the authority of the father. You know what I talk about? It? What this church is to the three-year-old? It's about the people who love him and pour out love on him. You think that goes away when you're older? We try to get so sophisticated in our theology and all we do is isolate ourselves from a relationship. This is not on script. But what we have to do is we have to come back into, uh, we have to re-engage with the community of the body of Christ. That it's, yes, you can find the Lord in the woods. And can I just say, oh man, I'm really gonna poke some bears here. You can find the Lord in the woods, but if you're intentionally doing that during the corporate gathering, your heart's in the wrong place. There's 160 something hours other in the week where you can practice that individual seeking him out. There's this time here that's important. There's, there's new believers in here that need what you have. If you feel like the church doesn't have anything else for you, then you're a cistern who's gone rancid. You have something to give. You need fresh life and fresh rain and fresh anointing to hit you. If you feel like you've hit a pinnacle and church just isn't it for you, I'm telling you, you've got, you've got discipling to do, you've got teaching to do, you've got training to do, you've got praying to do, you've got work in the kids' ministry, and you can work in the kids' ministry, and you can work in the kids' I'm feeling anointed right now, and you can work in the kids' ministry. If you feel like you've apexed, guess what? You have something to give. 
You've had your season of getting. You've had your season of gathering. It's time to give. It's going to get harder, so I have to speak more bluntly and more clearly. I know it's shocking because I always hold back. I know it's, you feel so easy right now. I'm going to share these words with you. First, I'll ask you the question, and some of you, are, some of you, you all know, you know what boxes you have God in. If it's an expression of worship that you, you refuse to go, if there's someone in this church that you ignore on purpose, that's a box. Time to break it. If you have like, if you spend an hour of your drive loathing about someone, it's a box. It's time to break it. Like if, if you wake up and you don't spend the first hour with the Lord and then it's all gone to waste. You could never spend, do you know that this book opens any time of the day? I know. I had that revelation this week. I was like, whoa, it's five in the way. It still opens. I f I, it seems like we put on our calendar on our New Year's resolution of how many times we're going to spend quiet time with the Lord. It's like, uh, like it has, it has this clock. It locks at certain times of the day. And I, I woke up late or I'm a mom with a thousand kids and I just don't know what I'm going to, guess what? It opens any time. <laughs> Your phone app opens any time. Guess what? Your Bible app opens just as much as Instagram. The same AI, the same features, the same programming. It's all there. Wow. He wants to break some boxes. He wants us to laugh at church again. Now I lost my spot. <laughs> and everyone said amen. <laughs> he wants to break some boxes. Some of you feel like he's not an abundant God. I, I've heard this before. I, this really, really bugs me. Man, this is good. It feels good. We're going to go along. We're going to go along. This feels good. I don't know if Coffee of the Master is going to have it. I'm not sure what's going to have it. This is so good. Listen, I know there's a lot like this huge wave of people within the body of Christ. We're like, oh, that's, that's prosperity gospel. That's, pros that's prosperity. You know, it's not. Pro it's prosperity, brother. Okay, I understand what they're saying. Can I, I'll just ask you, I'll ask the body this question. Is there any type of prosperity or blessing without any, within scripture? Oh, I'm glad we're all on the same page. The gospel is prosperous. It is, it's abundant. I'm not, I'm not trying to pedal one pendulum or the other. I'm trying to break off your shackles. I'm trying to relo uh, remove some scales from your eyes because some of us are like so against prosperity that we're over here and oh, we're just worms. Everything's terrible. We have to suffer. I can't wait for the tribulation. <laughs> It'll prove how awesome I am, how good of a Christian I am. I need to go up to the mountain and beat my head with a stick. <laughs> There's monks in the third century that, were, that thought they were so deprived, they went up to the mountain and beat themselves with sticks and cut rocks, and they wanted to feel pain. It's so far away from what the Lord is doing. And you can't be so lollipops and lions and stickers that you can't see when things are bad or when things are, are maybe hard. We're in denial in both camps. Okay, this, now let's get to the words. Um, as we were in worship today, I, um, I sensed that someone was maybe a couple people, you've been um, encountering some, you've been delving into witchcraft. You've been doing like some tarot cards or readings or calling psychic uh, hotlines, um, crystals. You've been trying to find power in somewhere else. And the Lord wants to deliver you that today. He wants, he wants you to cast those away today. Uh, maybe even you brought it in your purse. Like I'm, think, I'm seeing like cards or some kind of thing that you hold. And like you chant something and it's so demonic. 
and you've opened up the door. The Lord wants to close those doors right now. He's so tired. If that's, if that's you, if you've got that witchcraft right here, you just put it, up, put it up front at the altar. We'll take care of it for you. Just put it at the altar anytime. All right. Uh, I've got a word that someone had. No one's standing up right now. They're like, I don't want to be the one to stand up. I had a word that someone has, uh, you have blood in your urine. I had, I had it directly for someone, but then it wouldn't go away. So you've been having blood in your urine or you've had an infection in your urine. And the Lord says in his word that all these undignified parts, like what I'm saying, give those places the highest, of, the, the places of highest honor. And so I, I don't say those to try to embarrass or bring shame. But I say those because the Lord wants to do something about it. He wants to purify your urinary tract. He wants to drive out kidney stones. Today. You know, I've been thinking, and I told the staff this morning, I said, if, I, if we took all of our staff at our church and we all devoted 60 hours a week to just spending time with people who needed premarital counseling or marital counseling, we couldn't do enough. If I sat down in front of everyone who needed prayer or needed training or equipping to do the things that the, Holy, the, that the Bible is instructing us to do, there wouldn't be enough time. But do you know where there is enough time? Under the power of God. I believe that the power of God is here and it's resting in this room. I can, I've felt it since I got here this morning. I heard the power of God roll in like claps of thunder and his presence fill this space with, with cl like clouds. I felt his fire shoot through my bones and the oil of anointing on my hands. And when we give these words is that the power of God would rest on you, heal you, equip you, train you. And then we can come along and be a vitamin or, or, or just an adjective to what your calling is. But there's too much. There's too much at stake. There's not enough time. We can't count on tomorrow. It's only through the power of God that we'll actually do something. When I was in third grade, I fell over in the power of the Spirit. I'm not saying that that will happen or that won't happen. I'm just ready for both. I fell over in the power of the Spirit, and I had a calling to reach my generation, and that hasn't stopped. That was when I was nine. I'm now 34, still going after the thing that the Lord witnessed and ministered to me. No one else could have told me what I was going to do, but the Lord showed me in a vision for an hour and a half. I was, I was sucking carpet and weeping and crying out for him. If you want to change the world, you need to get under the power of God. I'm going to just tell you, if you need to change your marriage, you need to get under the power of God. If you got healing messed up in your body, you need to get under the power of God. It's time to stop running away from the power and the presence of God because he's ready to equip you. There's a quickening. I don't know if you can hear that. There's a quickening. There's a quickening. There's a quickening that's happening. Some of you, um, uh, one of you had just had a consult for a pacemaker. So something in your chest. Is that, if you're here, it's not like your urine, so I don't mind if you... If you just had a consult for your, a pacemaker, if you just raise your hand. No one. That's fine. Um, I feel like uh, I saw this. I saw this triangle, and it really represented marriages. I don't know if you've ever saw that, where it's like someone draws a triangle, and it's like there's you and your spouse, and you're connected, and God's at the top, and you're like going. You're each growing towards God. I feel like this, this culture has flipped that. Yeah. It's you and your spouse and you're not even pursuing God. He's at the bottom of the barrel. And I just want to pray for marriages that the Lord would, that the, the, the priority of the Lord would be flipped back to the top. Yes. Yes. Holy Spirit, I pray right now for every marriage. I pray that your power would rest on every marriage in this room. That your power would rest on every marriage in this room and that the priority of God would be flipped up to the top of utmost importance. 
that everything would fall to the wayside. I pray right now that you'd be healing trauma, that you'd be healing the timeline. You'd be healing the times of abuse and the silent treatment. You'd be healing the time of uh, feeling inadequate or feeling less than. You'd be healing the time of all the records of wrongs that have been kept, all the rudeness that's been perceived and projected and proclaimed. I thank you, Lord, right now that your power is breaking the bondage of brokenness in marriages, that you're bringing life and life abundantly, that the ears would be open, that they would hear you first, and that the filters of the demonic would be cast away right now in the name of Jesus. There's some of you, you're talking with your spouse, and it's like you're on two different planets right now, and the Lord is saying there is a demonic filter that's in between. It's something to do with the vow that you've made when you were first married of what you thought it would be, and it didn't end up the way you thought it would be, and the Lord says, I want to make it better than what you ever thought it would be. He's reconciling your past, your present, and your future because he's got a better plan for you. He's got abundance in your marriage. He's got love for your wife, husbands. He's got love for your wife that he's beginning to pour out on you right now. I pray right now that your tear ducts would open up. You'd begin to weep over how much you love your wife, how beautiful she is. I pray, wives, you would get downloads of, of who your husband is and who they're, what their calling is and what your calling is and how they work together. And I pray right now that God is becoming the priority in your marriage and through his power, he are getting on the same page. In Jesus' name. Is there, um, man, I'm just going out here. Is there a Karen? Is there anyone named Karen? You can raise your hand. I'll go every other today with words. I've got two services. Okay, no Karens. Okay, anyone with the initials JC or CJ? Initials with JC or C Okay. What's your name? CJ? Oh, that worked. <laughs> it, does it stand for something or? Charles Jr. Okay, what the Lord showed me is that he's really, you can go ahead and stand up if you want to, I don't know, do whatever you want. What the Lord showed me is that he's releasing wisdom and strategy. I don't know what financial, I don't know if you've been in financial hardship, but he's releasing wisdom and strategy. And what's happening is, is I saw the name Caleb and I saw the name Joseph. And Joseph is that wisdom and strategy that you'll know what the next step is. Caleb is for he's releasing a tenacity in you like never before. That you would be the same as at 40 that you were at, or you'd be at 80, you'd be the same as you were 40. And that God has promised you something and he's given you the tenacity to go after that thing that he's promised you. And he's, but he's given you the wisdom and strategy to do it. He's combining both of those things together. So that's what I have for you. Tom, you had something, Word, I, right? Joints, if you got something with your joints, we'll get a mic. During worship, I saw it was like a left elbow, but not exclusively a left elbow. It was like a, just a channel of God's glory. It was really shiny and I felt it represented a, a flow or just some kind of a release of anything related to any kind of a joint pain, anything to do with arteries. There was like this opening up, this sweeping freedom that God was releasing today. And it could be, even be marital, financial. There's just something being opened up. And so uh, I just want to ask if that's you in any way, I would ask that you would just stand up right now where you're at. Any kind of, with your blood, your arteries, you've got joint pain problems, you need something to break through, something to open up. I just want to ask you to stand right now and it'll be the first person. Thank you for this lady. I actually have a word for you, this lady right here. I just want you to stand up right here. Okay, good. All right. Just feel like we gotta get the people moving somehow. Uh, okay. Okay, so now what I, so we're gonna move, we're gonna do something here. So what I want you to do is I want you to 
uh, I want some people to go get around them. I don't think we're done with this, but I think this is like, these are hot spots. So go get around them. And Pastor Jeffrey, I think, probably has more. There's something catalytic happening here. Mm -hmm. And so go get around them. These are like hot spots. Okay? And then there are some people that I believe the Spirit of God is resting on. And I want to ask mm -hmm. that you would come up front here. And I believe God's going to do something with that. Do you feel something catalytic happening here in this room? Right now, Jeff, Pastor Jeffrey, you set the stage. You, you took us in. So, uh, Rick, back here, I believe the Spirit of God is resting on you. And would you just come up here? There's several people just, I believe God is resting on. There's a joy on you, Rick. And uh, I was just standing over there, mm -hmm. kind of. And what I want you to do, Rick, is I want you to come stand and face the audience. And I believe that this man represents joy. And if you need joy, then you come up and come put your hand on him, and it's going to bless him, but something is going to be imparted from him to you. So every person who needs joy, Rick, scoot over a little so you can give yourself some room. And step up so people can get around you. So I want you to, to so I'm going to ask everybody to stand up now. Let's go ahead and stand. If you need joy, then come get around this man and put your hand on him. God's going to give some joy right here, okay? That's right. Just put your hand on him. Start asking God to release his joy. What's going on with you, Jessica? So this young lady here, Jessica, her hands are burning. If you need healing of any kind, then come see her right now, right up here in the front. And if your hands are burning, then you come up and join her and turn around and face, and you be ready to give that away to somebody, okay? Yes, Jeffrey. Yeah. If you'd put out your hands, I'm just going to pray one more, one more prayer. Holy Spirit, rest on each person right now in Jesus' name. Move, wind of God. Anoint each person, Father. May your presence and your power fall on them. Pray that some, I feel like some of you are like getting a coat. You feel like you're almost like something is weighing your shoulders down. You might feel weak in the knees. I just continue to pray that God would pour out his power on you. The kingdom of God, his, the kingdom of his power is breaking in right now. Right now. There's a huge wave of it coming across right here in this space. More, Lord. More, Lord, in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Tracy, would you come on up front to Jesus' name. So I believe this woman, she and her husband, Brandon, come up in the front in the middle, if you would, please. Mm. I believe she represents breakthrough. A breaker anointing, the power of God. Just stand right there, three steps up, if you would, so people can get around you. If you need a breakthrough of any kind, need something to shift, something to move, something to break, come, come stand around Tracy right now, okay? I know some of you need that, so you got to move your feet. That's how it works. 